Well, friends, what a joy it's been to share this experience of worship with you. As we prepare our hearts to hear the word of the Lord, I invite you to join me in a word of prayer. Oh God, we pray in this moment that you would speak to us in profound ways. God, we need a word from you. We pray, God, that we remove every distraction and that we would center our heart, our minds, our attention right now on your word. Speak Holy Spirit, for we are listening. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Friends, I ask that you would allow me for the next couple of weeks to break liturgical protocol and fast forward in the passion narrative of Jesus. Spend the next two weeks examining Jesus' life in his final moments in the Garden of Gethsemane. As I studied the disposition of Jesus, the many statements that he makes in the Garden of Gethsemane before he goes to the cross, I believe that there are some powerful nuggets of wisdom and relevant lessons that you and I can glean from the Messiah as he lives in what I want to describe as the most difficult day in his life. I'm titling this series, this two-week series, In the Garden. Lessons from the most difficult day in Jesus' life. For the first part of this series, I want to call your attention to the gospel according to Mark. Mark's gospel, chapter number 14. I want to read verses 32 through 36 in your hearing from the New Living Translation as Jesus is praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. At verse 32, the word of the Lord records, they went to the olive grove called Gethsemane. And Jesus said, sit here while I go and pray. And he took Peter and James and John with him. And he became deeply troubled and distressed. He told them, my soul is crushed with grief to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. And he went on a little further and fell to the ground. And he prayed that if it were possible, the awful hour awaiting him might pass him by. Abba, Father, he cried out. Everything is possible for you. Please take this cup of suffering away from me. Yet, I want your will to be done, not mine. It's at verse 36 that I want to focus our time together. When he says, please take this cup of suffering away from me. Yet, I want your will to be done not mine. My friends, this is the word of the Lord and we say thanks be to God. For a few moments, as we go into the garden of Gethsemane with Jesus Christ, examining what I will recall as what I call his most difficult day here on earth, I want to use for a thought, your will be done. My friends, I want you to hear me If you don't hear anything else I say in this sermon, I need you to hear these words. That is, God wants to accomplish God's will for your life. That you are not designed by mistake. In fact, you and I are here to live out God's will for our lives. And God wants to show you, reveal to you what his will is for your life. And the Lord wants to accomplish his will through your life. And my goal today is to help us to see just a bit clearer as to how important relinquishing our will to God's will truly is. And I want to do this by examining the final hours of the life of Jesus Christ. For Jesus, my brothers and my sisters, the hour has come. He's in the Garden of Gethsemane, but he's lived life for some 33 
years. For 33 years, through all of the miracles and teachings and experiences, Jesus is on the final leg of his journey. He's foretold of this moment countless times and death for our Savior is now inevitable. And friends, he begins to literally feel the weight of the world not only on his shoulders, but also in his spirit. And in his final hours, he goes to the place that had served as his sanctuary of prayer throughout his ministry. He goes to the Garden of Gethsemane. And he gets there. And when he arrives, he is not rejoicing, but he's in agony. He's in agony because what is to come and the Bible says in verse became deeply troubled and distressed. My friends, the truth is Jesus has already had one heck of a day. He's just released Judas from the ranks of the disciples at the Last Supper. Judas has sold him out. And he knows it's only a matter of time now before he's captured and he has to face death on the cross. Go with me, friends, as we imagine what's going on in the mind of Jesus. Can you imagine what he's thinking about? I mean, what would you be thinking about if you just got betrayed and you know you're about to die. And perhaps the deeper question is, have you just ever had one of those days? One of those days where everything was seemingly falling apart and nothing was coming together. It's just one of those days. And you feel like the singer Monica who said, it's just one of them days. When I want to be all alone. Have you ever just been there? And Jesus decides. It's just been one of those days. And so he steals away. He steals away by himself. After leaving his disciples in a place in the garden. To pray to the Father because his agony has become too great for him to bear by himself. And when you read through the synoptic gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they all give us the same general iteration of what happens in the garden. But each adds their own details. That's why I like the synoptics. They add their own details for the audiences that the writers are writing to. And But when you start reading the gospel, according to Mark. Y'all, I like Mark's iteration of this because Mark adds greater detail regarding Jesus's prayer in the garden. I don't want you to miss how Jesus prays and what Jesus prays in the garden. Listen to this prayer of Jesus. Verse 35, Bible says he went on a little further and fell to the ground and he prayed if it were possible that the awful hour awaiting him might pass him by. Abba, Father, he cries out. Everything is possible for you, God. So please, please take this cup of suffering away from me. Yet, I want your will to be done, not mine. God, take the cup of suffering, but not my will. Let your will be done. Beloved, I want to tell you, Jesus knows what he must do. But when the hour arrives to walk 
into God's will for his life, Jesus has a sobering, human-like moment that all of us have when confronted with the audacious task of fulfilling our purpose because the truth is purpose can be frightening. Let me say that one more time. For the person who is wondering how your purpose is going to unfold, for the person who is watching this and you are seeking God for your purpose and you are a bit scared of what God has said to you and what God has shown you purpose can be frightening purpose isn't always roses and happy places purpose will garner you enemies and sleepless nights and emotional turmoil and immense battles of the soul and the mind Jesus is confronted right here with his purpose and beloved this is perhaps one of the most authentic prayers that Jesus prays that you and I I can pray when wrestling with God's will for our lives and that is to acknowledge that fulfilling God's will isn't always connected to a willingness and Jesus understood that the closer he got to the cross the more the enemy of doubt and depression and defeat would come against him. And that's a word for someone right now who is walking in their purpose, living out God's will, walking in your assignment. And that is the closer you get to your destiny, the more you will doubt, the more you will wrestle, and the more you will have to fight the internal and the external demons, which here it is, is an indicator that you are close to greatness, that you are nearing God's will for your life. And I have come to encourage someone to stop thinking that the closer you get to your purpose, the easier life is going to become. I'm sorry, it just don't go down like that. That's not the reality of our lives. It is the reality, however, that the closer you get to fulfilling your greatness, your assignment in God's will, the more more you will wrestle and struggle with life. You don't believe me, I need you to come to the football field and take a lesson from those who play football. Because when a team gets in the red zone, the defense goes into what's called goal line formation. And a goal line stance brings in the biggest and the strongest defensive personnel on the opposing team because after the offense has driven down the field, the defense's primary objective is to stop them at all costs from getting into the end zone. Some of you right now are in the red zone of your purpose and the enemy is lined up in goal line formation against you with the primary goal of keeping you from touching down into your your destiny but you got to understand something about a good offense because a good offense always prepares for red zone situations so no matter what defense comes no matter who lines up in front of you they are able to get into the end zone because you have prepared for the red zone preach pastor and Jesus is in the red zone right now of God's will for his life and he knows that at what will get him to the place of willingness to get over and touch down into his destiny is the power of prayer because a good offense in the red zone always needs prayer to be on your side the enemy cannot overcome you if you've got a strong prayer life the enemy cannot overcome you if you know how to call on the name of the Lord in times of crisis and am I preaching to anybody that says pastor I know that prayer is the greatest offense that I have in the red zone even when the defense of the enemy is lined up against me because prayer changes things. It's prayer. And I want you to see the authenticity with which Jesus prays and the place from which he prays. And this is the Jesus ah, that I like. I like this Jesus. I like the Jesus that can pray prayers like we pray. 
I like the Jesus who understands that walking down the road to destiny isn't always easy. Now this Jesus is raw. This Jesus is real. This Jesus is struggling to be obedient to God his Father even unto death. This Jesus struggling to accept God's will yet willing to do what must be done to make God's name great in the earth and watch it he does it from a place of grief and agony this is the real Jesus this is the Jesus like you and like me and I want you to hear what he tells his disciples verse 34 it's right there when they get to the Garden of Gethsemane, here's what Jesus expresses to his disciples. He says, look, brothers, my soul is crushed with grief to the point of death. He says, I don't want you to think that walking in God's will is easy. I don't want you to think that holding this purpose that I've been sent to this earth to fulfill this assignment that I've been given by God is going to be easy. He says, brothers, you got to understand something. Yes, we've laughed. Yes, we've cried. Yes, we've served. Yes, we've done ministry in all the earth. But I need you to get where I am in this moment. Jesus says, my spirit is crushed with grief to the point of death. And my brothers and my sisters, the question that you should be wrestling with right now is what is it about this purpose that the Lord has or this assignment that causes his soul so much agony? Well, if you would allow me to dig a little deeper here and I want to paint a picture as to why Jesus would be feeling this way about such a glorious assignment. I want to suggest to you that first he understands that he is innocent and that he must become guilty to save us. Think about it. The one who knew no sin is taking on every person's sins. The one who was righteous in all his ways is taking on our wickedness. The one who was love incarnate among us is taking on the guilt and the shame and the transgressions of this world. He's having to drink the cup of suffering for you and me. And he was innocent. Not only does he understand his innocence, but secondly, and perhaps most uniquely, he understands who he's dying for. Y'all, let me get deep. He knows who he's got to go to the cross to save. He's dying for people who would praise him on the road to Jerusalem on Sunday, waving palm branches and laying their clothes on the road, shouting Hosanna in the highest, but they would condemn him to death by Friday. He's dying for them. He's dying for those who plotted against him and only appreciated his ministry as long as he was working miracles. He is dying for the Judas who would betray him, for the Peter who would deny him, and for every person in history who would turn their back on him but still try to claim him. He's dying for all of them, for all of us. Jesus knows who he's dying for, and in his final hours, he cries out, Abba, Father, everything is possible, but please take this cup of suffering from me because he knows he's innocent and he knows who he's dying for but Jesus says even though I realize this yet I want your will to be done not mine and friends I want to suggest to you the truth is so many of us pray that prayer we pray Lord I want to do your will. You ever prayed that prayer? 
You ever got spiritual with God in your prayer time or you learn some scriptures or you come to church some consecutive Sundays or you join the church or join a ministry and now you say, God, I want to do your will. And you pray that prayer with all sincerity, but often in the back of our minds when we pray that prayer, we are putting stipulations on what that actually looks like. And what we really mean often when we pray that prayer Here it is. We mean, Lord, I'll do your will as long as it's convenient. Or we say, Lord, I'll do your will as long as it coincides with my timeline. Oh, Lord, I'll do your will as long as it doesn't bring any pain or setbacks. Lord, I'll do your will as long as I don't have to commit too much of my time that will take away from my boo, from my job, from my fun, from my vacation, from my social organizations, from my boards, from my revenue or my routine in general. And what we're really saying to God is that we don't want to do God's will. We want to do our will and disguise it as if we're doing God a favor by saying, Lord, I want to do your will. And let me be clear, to be honest, I'm cool. I'm cool with what Jesus prays. I'm cool with the honesty that Jesus gives to God. And many of us would be so much better served if we were just honest. Lord, I don't want to do this. And that's what Jesus says. Lord, I really don't want to do this. Because Jesus understands that God's will is not for glamour, but it's for glory. Somebody type that and tweet that properly, that God's will for your life is not for glamour, it's for glory. And glory will always cost you something. And so the question is, do you know what God's will is for your life? And a deeper question is, what does it mean to live out God's will for your life? If you would just allow me to break this down for the next few minutes, looking at the life of Jesus and his prayer and actions in this, in this initial part of the Garden of Gethsemane, I want to suggest, first thing that you need to understand about living out the will of God for your life is that at some point you've got to learn, number one, to embrace the weight of what you do not want. You've got to learn to embrace the weight of what you don't want. The Bible says that Jesus prays this prayer. He says, Lord, take this cup of suffering away from me. Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. Jesus here understands something significant and he reminds us that God's will is always too great for you and I to handle alone. Don't you miss this concept. In fact, if it is God's will for you, then you will ultimately need God to help you carry it and even to accept it. And what Jesus teaches us is that the will of God can often be so heavy That it is not really something that you choose, but rather it is an assignment that God chooses for you to live and carry out in the earth. It is the responsibility of your contribution to God's narrative of history that is given to you to carry. And beloved, you need to hear me clearly when I say this. If it's given to you, you are the only one that can carry what God gives to you to carry. It's got your name on it. It's God's will for your life. Your mama and your daddy can't carry it for you. Hubby or wifey can't carry it for you. Boo or bae can't carry it for you. The preacher can't even carry it for you. It's God's will for your life. You must carry it by yourself. This is your cross to bear. The weight is yours to handle. And if you don't do it, it just won't get done. And it's an interesting reality, my brothers and my sisters, that when you begin to live out the will of God for your life, 
you are humbled by that will because God is using God's purpose through you not to bless you only but for you to be a blessing for someone else let me say that again so you don't miss it that when God is living out God's will through your life it's not for you it's to bless someone else and Jesus is clear y'all he doesn't want the weight of the will he doesn't want to carry the weight of this purpose but he knows it's what he's called to do he knows it's what he's been assigned to do it's one thing I love about our church Let's see if I can illustrate this point a bit further I love about our church is that um, we've got so many current and former educators here at Cascade I love our educators here at our church and for all of my educators who are watching, you can testify that when you gave your class an assignment, you didn't ask whether or not they wanted to do it. No, you are the teacher. You know the plan for the day and for the year and the assignments that you give to each of your students is meant to accomplish that plan. They may kick and scream, but it's a part of the plan. They may tell mom and them about what you made them do, but it's a part of the plan. And if they do the assignment you've instructed, they pass and get a good grade. But they always have a choice whether or not to do it. But there are always consequences for the choice that they make. If they don't do the assignment that you've given them, they get a failing grade. And every grade they received and will receive is attached to an academic record. And colleges get that record. Grad schools get that record. Jobs they apply to can get that record. And that's why you must complete the assignment at the teacher's instructions or you risk sacrificing your future on the altar of mediocrity. And Jesus says, God, I don't want to do this, but it's a part of my assignment. So nevertheless, not my will. I want your will to be done. And my brothers and sisters, I know and you should as well that you are operating in the will of God when you are, an ex when you are accepting and assignment that you really don't want but it is God's instruction to you that you carry it because he wants to know will you be obedient and accept the assignment that I've given you even if you don't want it but you know it will bring me glory in the earth it's your assignment do y'all mind if I testify right quick uh, if you know me I mean if you really know me you know that I love being a pastor. I absolutely love what I do. But if I can be honest with you and transparent, when God called me to preach and pastor as a teenager, uh, I wasn't even thinking about becoming a pastor. I had no real desire to be a pastor. But I knew that I loved people. I knew that I loved to help people. I knew that I had a compassionate heart for serving the community. I knew I enjoyed speaking. And I absolutely knew that I loved the church. I was raised and reared in the church. But I didn't want to be a pastor. No, I wanted to be a CEO like my father. That's why I went to business school. That's why I took public speaking. That's why I led the largest business organization at the, I love, Jackson State University. Because I wanted to be in corporate America like my father. Not pastoring. And I'll be honest, I didn't want, want to be a pastor because I grew up in the church. And I saw on too many occasions how they often treated, how people often treated their own pastor. And because 
There are often projections and expectations placed on pastors and spiritual leaders that were unrealistic. And yes, I want to suggest to you that we are called to walk in moral integrity, and I believe that, and I do that, but pastors are human just like you. And I knew that if I became a pastor, and if someone came at me sideways, I would come right back. <laughs> and God was still working on me. I knew that I still had some Brandon, Mississippi in me, I knew that I was still an unfinished product, and if it came down to it, you might catch me operating in the thug spirit of Peter every now and then. Because even like Jesus experienced, people can be a trip. But friends, in all seriousness, I knew that ministry was also a weight. And it was a weight that I didn't believe I could carry, nor did I want to carry, and I knew that if I had to carry it, I couldn't carry it alone. And then one day it happened. On one evening at Jackson State University, I led someone to Jesus Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit, and I began to see their life change. And then on July the 24th, 2005, I stood in my home church, Trinity United Methodist Church in Brandon. Mississippi and I preached my first sermon in front of the entire community and the Spirit of God fell upon me and I desired to know more about the Lord as I graduated from Jackson State University I got a scholarship to Emory University Candler School of Theology and door after door began to open in seminary and then I went to Duke and got my doctoral work done and more doors began to open and then door after door began to open and I began to see people people's lives saved and transformed and God then sent me a companion in Ashley to walk on the journey with me and now after 16 years of preaching and pastoring and teaching and leading I stand here right now today leading one of the greatest congregations in all of the earth through a coronavirus pandemic and I didn't even ask for this no God gave it and there's someone right now who's on the fence about your destiny there's someone right now who says, Pastor, I don't want to accept the assignment that God has given to me. Good. It's good that you don't want it. It's because God knows he can trust you with it because you've got to be obedient to carry it. And I've come by to preach somebody's word that you can carry it, that you can handle it. And when you say yes to the Lord, you will see door open over here, way made over there, mountain moved over there. God has a way of opening opening things up once you say not my will but your will be done and you develop a passion for what you never thought you would do and you can't get away from it because you know it's not what you chose but it's what God chose you for oh he says I've got to learn to embrace the weight of what you don't want, of what we don't want. But here's number two, not only do you have to embrace the weight of what you don't want, but at some point we learn that we have to release the expectation of others to carry what God has given to us to carry. To carry. I want you to hear me clearly that your will is for you. God's will for you is for you. And when you read this text, Jesus tells his closest companions, Peter, James, and John, to stay right here and pray with him. And after revealing to them the condition of his spirit, Jesus expected his friends of all people to empathize with the assignment that he had to fulfill. And Mark records three times when Jesus returned to his closest companions, he found them asleep. Tells them in verse 34, stay here, keep watch with me. But by the time we get to verse number 37, he returns and he finds his disciples asleep. He says to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Couldn't you just watch with me for even an hour, man? Keep watch so that you won't come into temptation. 
The spirit is willing, but the body is weak. In verse 39, Jesus left them again, prayed the same prayer. By verse number 40, when he returned, he found them sleeping again, and they couldn't even open their eyes. Verse 41 says, he turns, goes a third time and prays. He comes back and he says, you know what? Go ahead and sleep. Have your rest. What happens in the Garden of Gethsemane is what you and I will often experience in this life. And that is when you want people close to you to feel the weight of the calling that you feel. And to be honest, you just really want someone with whom you can share the burden. But this is a lesson that I have to give to you straight up. It's your assignment. It's your call. And although they see you agonizing over it, although they see you putting in all the hours and energy into it, though they see the late nights and you staying up working on it, God didn't give it to them. God gave it to you and I don't care how much they think they know they'll never ever feel the full responsibility of it like you do that's why I've come by to encourage someone as I close the sermon that's why you can't stop going you can't stop the journey when other people don't understand that's why you can't give up on your dreams when others don't share your excitement or they even try to discourage you. You have to learn to be okay with the affirmation and the support that God gives because the will of God will take you up a hill. It will take you to a cross. It will take you on a journey that only you can walk. And every now and then, yes, God will give you assignment of serene. He'll give you a community to help you along the way, but you're still the one that must carry the cross and the question is can you still make it happen even when others don't understand or like Jesus's homeboys in the garden even when they fall asleep and they don't support do you need support in order to fulfill God's will do you need everybody to understand it and Jesus teaches us that yes you've got to embrace the weight of of what you don't, but at some point in your life, you've got to learn that this is your cross to carry. And you've got to be confident walking in the vision that God has given unto you. And number three, what we see from Jesus is he embraces, he releases the expectation of others, but here it is, he commits to walk in God's will for his life. And friends, at some point, you're going to have to make up in your mind that you're going to commit to walk in God's will. He says in verse number 41, 42, he says, but no, the time has come. The son of man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Up, let's be going. Look, my betrayer is here. He says, guys, it's time to go now. He says, my soul is tired, but it's time to go says, I want this cup to pass from me, but it's time to go. I've grieved to the point of death and I've prayed until blood has streamed down my face, but now it's time to go. And my friends, Jesus gives us the blueprint of what you must do when there's anxiety in completing God's will for your life. And that is at some point you must make the commitment and the decision to commit yourself to walking in God's will, come what may. And the first person he's got to encounter is Judas. Oh God. He's got to encounter the man he knew would betray him. And before he even gets to the cross, his first test is to encounter the man who betrayed him. God, why a test like this? And this is what we're going to pick up next week. Because next week, I want to show you how Judas handled, how Jesus handles the kiss from the one who would betray him. He's got to deal with Judas first. And then he can come to his moment of glory as he goes to the cross. But as I close, can I give you a sneak peek? Can I give you just a quick look into next week? 
Because somebody's going to ask, where did Jesus get the strength to continue on after he was agonizing in prayer in the garden? Well, there is a clause that you won't find in Mark. There's a scripture you won't find in Matthew. No, it's only recorded in Luke's gospel, chapter number 22, beginning at verse 42, concluding with verse 44. When Jesus prays, Father, if you are willing to take this cup from me, yet not my will, yet your will be done, the Bible says right here, and an angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. Just in case you missed it, Jesus is in agony. Jesus is in pain. He doesn't know how he's going to fulfill the will of God. He wants to let the cup pass. But while he says, yet not my will, yet your will be done, the Bible says in Luke that God sends an angel to him to strengthen him and to lift him so that he can continue praying more earnestly until sweat, until blood starts flowing down his faith but the angel shows up and gives him strength and what I want you to hear me say is that God is going to give you the strength that you need to press on a little further for anyone who's ready to throw in the towel and to give up on your destiny God is going to show up in a moment where you're agonizing in a moment where you don't know what's going to happen and the Lord will strengthen you for the journey ahead Oh, hallelujah, somebody ought to testify. Somebody ought to give God glory right now for every time he showed up and he strengthened you. For every time he showed up and gave you energy for the journey, the Lord is going to strengthen you right now in this season to complete God's will for your life. My friends, you've got to learn to embrace the weight of what you don't want. God assigned it to you, and the Lord's going to give you the strength to carry it. You've got to release the expectations of other people to carry what God has given to you. And at some point, you must commit yourself fully to what it means to carry God's will with you everywhere you go and commit to it. Because this is not for glamour. It's for the glory that God is trying to reveal in you and how God is trying to use you to bless the world. Not my will, but God's will be done. In Jesus' name, amen. Friends, I pray that you have been blessed by this experience of worship. Oh, what a joy it has been to be in the presence of our God with you. And as you continue on this journey ahead, I believe something amazing is in store for you, especially if you want to become a member of this church today. Look, we would love to be your place to belong. I would love to be your pastor. We would love to be your church family. Go right now to cascadeumc.org and there you can click on join our family. We would love to have you as a part of the Cascade family. Become a member today and see where God continues to open up doors in your life and how it is that God allows your testimony to be a blessing to others through your work in this church. Well, friends, thank you so much. Share this stream. Thank you for your love. Thank you for how you continue to love on one another. And we pray that you will continue to live for God. Love God and follow God. And my prayer is that you would continue to stay the course. God bless you. Have a great week. Bye-bye.